The 2022 NFL Draft is shaping up to be much different than in recent years past. It figures to be only the fourth time since 2009 that a non-quarterback is likely to be selected with the first overall pick. The current favorite to go number one is Oregon edge rusher Kayvon Thibodeau. He may not have the gaudy sack totals, but he does possess the skill and athleticism NFL teams are looking for up front. A player who's helped his draft stock the most this season is fellow pass rusher Aiden Hutchinson. He's tallied more sacks in his senior year than his first three years combined. and was thought by many to have a similar ceiling to Thibodeau. As far as the quarterbacks go, there's still time in the season for draft prospects to help themselves. Matt Corral is likely to be the first signal caller selected, but Carson Strong and Kenny Pickett also possess strong NFL traits. There are several talented defensive backs in this class, highlighted by Derek Stingley Jr. and Kyle Hamilton, but the deepest positional group could be wide receiver. There's been at least five wide outs taken in the first round in the past two drafts, and there's a good chance that may happen once again in 2022. Draft stocks are rising and falling as the college season winds down and the journey to the 2022 NFL Draft begins. Hard to believe we are almost through the college football season there as you take a look at Ryan Wilson's latest mock draft. Now at the very top, not a whole lot's changing so far. We'll see what Brady Quinn, Danny Cannell have to say about that. Something else I want to mention that is not in this top 10. Can he pick going to the Browns at 16? And Ryan has got to explain himself. I'm Amanda Garrett. Let's welcome back Brady Quinn, Danny Canal, and Ryan Wilson going through his latest mock draft there. So let's start at the very top, same as last week. He has the Lions taking Kayvon Thibodeau with the first overall pick. Brady, what do you think about him sticking with that? Well, can I just ask you this, Ryan? I mean, can you crack open an ice cold beer, maybe mix yourself a nice adult beverage, loosen up a little bit, and change up the first overall pick? I mean, don't the Lions potentially need to think about life after Jared Goff, or do they maybe want to trade out of the pick? accumulate some more picks for this whole rebuilding process. I know they just got a tie this past week, but like, is, is an edge rusher really the position they need to go right now? Or don't you think they need to accumulate some more picks? I know you've done a bunch of these and you will do more. Can we start to mix it up a little bit? <laughs> No, that's actually a great idea, Brady. And you're right. I've done 11 so far, and there are about 25 more to come. So I've got to pace myself. I don't want to do everything in the first month and a half, and then I have nothing left in the old chamber there. But I do understand what you're saying. And look, I've talked to you about this before, and I've talked to scouts about this. I'm not convinced that Aiden Hutchinson won't be the best player in this draft class by the time it's all said and done. That doesn't mean he won't go first, but that doesn't solve your issue with the Lions making them a better team. An edge rusher isn't going to take them from a, an 0-8-1 team as we sit here to a team that can com compete for a playoff spot. The quarterback situation is one they have to sort out. Unfortunately, as we've talked about every week, there ain't a quarterback at the top of this draft class that's going to come in and magically fix that team because there's so many other issues. And we saw with the 2020 class, or 2021 class, excuse me, how important fit is, uh, specifically talking about Mac Jones. So I get what you're saying, and I'm going to take your advice under advisement and next week I might do something crazy and when we meet again in seven days we'll have something to talk about. This is your fault. You're going to make him change it all up. But no, Dan, like Danny, Danny's going to win right now and Danny's going to make him mix it up. That's right. I'm going to I'm going to make him do something but I, I'm with Ryan though. I've, we've been doing this. We got a lot more of these shows to do. I know there's going to be some shake up down the road and right I think it's interesting you bring that up though because what are the Lions going to do at quarterback? I, there's not a great option. I think if you were going to draft a quarterback, it'd be fantastic to move back, get more picks, take a quarterback in the second round, which is probably where I'd put most of the quarterbacks that we've ranked in the first round, but teams over draft. So I think it's going to be fascinating to see how this unfolds. But Brian, you save the drama for later, man. You're doing the right thing. Slow play it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just say this, though, and I know it was under a different regime technically when you look at the Lions and previous drafts, but they took McNeil last year, I want to say, what, the third round? Onwu Zariki they took in the second round last year on the defensive front. Remember, they signed Trey Flowers. That was a big free agent acquisition. They traded for Michael Brockers. They drafted Julian Aquara. They signed Romeo Aquara to a big extension. I mean, the Lions have time and time again <laughs> tried to improve prove that defensive front I, I just I don't know where it's got them again I know it was a previous regime but I do think they need to sort of thinking about maybe moving back accumulating some picks or maybe looking at look at that quarterback position say hey, who's the best in this draft class if we don't feel like Jared Goff is gonna get done or he's not our guy so if they are looking to move back and get some of those picks then who would move up to get Kayvon Thibodeau 
That's the biggest question because I don't think it's necessarily to move back and get Kayvon Thibodeau. I think it's to move back and take a quarterback that they really value or what? another position player. What so, teams would move up to get him, though? Well, you have to look at the top 10, 10, 10 here and say Matt Corral, Washington football team, that would be a team that's in striking distance. Uh, I don't think the Jets are done with Zach Wilson yet. Depending on how the season ends, maybe the Giants, who are sitting there saying to themselves, we'd like to get a quarterback in this trap. Maybe it's the Houston Texans. They were sitting there at number two, and they don't feel comfortable sitting at number two, letting someone leapfrog them. So a lot of what ifs, but I think you can make a number of cases for some of the teams in the top ten to maybe move up to get that quarterback. All right, let's talk about the Texans at number two. Aiden Hutchinson going to Michigan. Uh, same thing as last week, Ryan. And, and you like him here, but Danny, do you like Aiden Hutchinson here? I love it. And I'll give Brady credit for kind of, you know, giving me this thought earlier a few weeks ago saying, man, I'm not so sure Aiden uh, Hutchinson isn't the best pass rusher in this class. I think Kayvon Thibodeau gives you the more upside. But if you want a player who's ready to go now, I mean, again, he shined last week against Penn State. He had three sacks, a forced fumble. And I want to see players who step up to the moment on the big stage and make impactful plays. And he's done that all season long for the Michigan Wolverines. So I think this is a player that's starting to really take notice. He's long. He's got length. He can get off the ball really quick. He can impact the passer. And that's what teams are looking for. So I think Ryan's spot on here, still having a two. And I do think, the uh, you know, as much as the upside is there for Kayvon Thibodeau, I think Aiden Hutchinson may be the sure bet over the long term. And maybe the Texans have that kind of fall into their lap at this position. Whoever, if, they, if it's Thibodeau one, Hutchinson two, whoever's two is getting an incredible player that might be the better one in the long run. Yeah, Brady, you've, you've sort of compared Hutchinson to Jared Allen. For me, like the more I watch, the more I think this guy is half J.J. Watt, half T.J. Watt. If they had another brother outside of Derek, no disrespect to Derek, it would be Aiden Hutchinson. He would be in the middle there. That's how competitive he is, and he gets after it every single play. Sometimes you see Thibodeau, uh, he gets lost for a series or two. He's not making the impact that Hutchinson does, and it, it's just a testament to how good these edge rushers are coming out of Michigan. Quiddy Pay last year, Rashawn Gary to the Packers a few years ago, Josh Uche, Chase Winovich both went, both went to the Patriots. And they keep turning these guys out. And four or five or six years from now, we may look back and say Aiden Hutchinson is the best of the group because he has played so well. And he's made huge strides from two years ago to last year, the COVID season, to how he's playing this year. And he's gone, for me, from probably a fourth-round pick two years ago, if he had come out then, uh, to a, a top-five guy and maybe even a top overall pick. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the list here. All right, I'm looking at the list. All right, hold on. One, I'm going to the top ten in the teens. Not I don't see David Ajabo, the other defensive end there for Michigan. Now, he's tied with Aiden Hutchinson and Sachs. Ryan, when are we getting David Ajabo a part of this first-round list, man? He has been outstanding this year. you got to start giving him some love, too. I know they both go to Michigan. You feel like you're giving the Wolverines a little too much, but both these guys may end up being first-round picks. I love him. I love him, Brady. I have him as an early second round pick right now, and I'll talk to teams and see what they think. But he jumped off the screen at me because you're watching Hutchinson on the other side, and you say, okay, who's this dude that keeps showing up? They have uh, uh, a linebacker in the middle of the field who's also making plays. They have Daxon Hill at safety. They have a lot of guys on this defense who are balling out, and I don't mean balling out guys that will be on the NFL rosters. I mean guys that could be top 100 picks, top 50 picks. And Ojabo, you're onto something. If he sticks into the first round by the time this thing is all said and done, I would completely believe Believe it. Uh, we see guys, guys that didn't play last year that snuck into the first round simply because of their athleticism. He's put it on tape. He is fast. He is strong. He is physical. There aren't a lot of holes in this game. Uh, he just needs to play more football. But, I mean, you can say that about every college guy as we enter the, the, you know, the stretch here the last month of the season. We'll see if he moves into the first round in another mock draft there. All right, right now the Falcons have the 12th overall pick. Now Ryan points out they could use a wide receiver here, but he has them taking Clemson cornerback Andrew Booth Jr. Danny, he would be the second corner off the board behind Derek Stingley. What do you think about that move? I like it. With Stingley's questionable health, he hasn't been able to play this year. I wonder, you know, if that's going to hurt him at all. And Andrew Booth, I know Clemson has had a down season so far this year, but the defense has actually been one of the bright spots. And at six feet, he's tall enough to go with some of the bigger wide receivers. They play plenty of zone, plenty of man, so he should be able to adapt to the NFL schemes. And he's got great ball skills, great hands for a defensive back on the back end. So as Clemson's kind of flown under the radar this season because they do have those three losses, Andrew Booth has been one of the bright spots to this team. So I think there's a chance he could challenge for maybe one of the top defensive backs taken in the NFL.
I'm with you, Danny. The, the downside to Andrew Booth is that he just hadn't played a lot of football. Uh, his base, best game of the year so far was against Georgia in the opener. Uh, they only targeted him twice to that side of the field. We know Georgia's offense isn't lights out, but that's a really good football team. And he's been up and down since, but I think a lot of that is because of injuries. I actually went to the Syracuse game to see Andrew Booth, and like me, he was on the sidelines. He had a hamstring issue. Uh, both my hamstrings are fine, by the way, but he didn't play, so I didn't get to see him in person. Uh, but the athleticism that you see from him on the field, hamstrings are doing great, Brady. <laughs> is what you like to see as it translates to the next level. So his teammate, if he goes to Atlanta, A.J. Terrell, played at Clemson. He's having a really good season on a defense that admittedly has been up and down, mostly down. But I think he can make that same transition that Terrell did, uh, Andrew Booth, should he end up in Atlanta. All these mock drafts, you know, we got to be careful. Ryan doesn't pull a hammy while he's putting all these things together. <laughs> Ryan, you have him like in fits on the desk right now. All right, let's talk about the next one because I'm going to start with Brady on this one. And then, Ryan, you're going to have to follow here. 16 Browns, you have them taking Pitt quarterback Kenny Pickett going to them. Brady's emails are normally like very subdued. Like, it, this had like question marks, exclamation marks, all caps beside it. What about Baker? Ahead, what about Baker, Ryan? What do you think? What's going on? Uh, here's the thing. Uh, I won't say who texted me after that Browns debacle against the Patriots, but it was a, a Cleveland sports fan who may or may not have a radio show who was very angry about having to defend B Baker, and he was done with it. He said, I'm done with it. And, look, I don't love Kenny Pickett as a first-rounder. Danny mentioned that you could argue that there aren't any first-rounders in this draft class, and that's a fair argument. Kenny Pickett played pretty well against Sam Howell, and, Bray, you know, you, you like Sam Howell, and Sam Howell actually played pretty well in that Rain Bowl last Thursday night. But this is just interesting for me. If you're Andrew Barry, the GM who has made it clear that quarterback is an incredibly important uh, position in order to build around, and that's what their game plan is. Now, he said this before the season, so no commentary on, on Baker's performance, but Baker's been injured, Baker's been inconsistent. I thought Kevin Stefanski would be the missing piece to Baker taking that next step, to make, taking the next step to getting that contract for $35 plus million plus a year. He has one more year in the steal, the fifth-year option, but if you like Kenny Pickett in the middle of the first round, there are going to be teams that are going to go after Kenny Pickett, and he's almost Baker's age. He's 24 years old. He has the experience. He's made the huge lead from last year to this year. He does a lot of things well. Like I said, I still have questions about him. But if you're the Browns and there's no free agent options and you're not sold on Baker beyond 2022, roll the dice on Kenny Pickett in the middle of the first round. I mean, it's a 50-50 chance you hit on these quarterbacks anyway. And if you're leaning towards him or some other quarterback, what's the harm in, on the team, and Brady, you might disagree with this, that doesn't have a ton of needs that should be much better than they currently are because of injuries? It's a great point. It's a great roster. I don't know that they're ready to move on from Baker Mayfield, in my opinion, though. But I love the fact you got him in the first round. He's my favorite quarterback of this year's draft class. And I think one of the things that stands out the most is the downfield passing game. And at times, you know, he'll just play from the pocket. But other times, he really scrambles, buys time, and still keeps his eyes downfield. He reminds me of a young Ben Roethlisberger coming out of Miami of Ohio. He's Yikes. not as big, but that's who his game reminds <laughs> me of when I turn on the tape and watch him. So why not make him a perfect fit to replace Big Ben in Pittsburgh. Hell, he's already there. He's already practicing at the same practice facility there in Pittsburgh. They're already, they're already practicing the same indoor facility there in Pittsburgh and playing the same stadium. So the bottom line is, if you're looking for Big Ben's replacement, I think we're looking at him right now on the screen. Keep him home. Keep him in Pittsburgh. Let him keep growing. Bring back these big chunk plays downfield and the athleticism, the ability to shake off some plays and then be able to run downfield and play tough. He is really, to me, won over me with his demeanor, the way he's played this year, and uplifted everyone around him. So I love the fact you got him in the first round. He deserves to be, be that guy, and I think he'd be a great fit for the Steelers. I'm with you, Brady. It would, it would be the perfect heir apparent to Ben, and I just don't know if they would. If he falls, that's where I think if he fell in the second round or maybe you're a Steelers, maybe you move up, maybe one of those last picks in the first round to get that uh, contract set up to where you can have that option. But I love like 32 touchdowns, four interceptions, but also you hit on something there. He's a player who's raised everybody's level of play around him. Like, I think this is really hard to judge quarterbacks now that play at Alabama, that play at Ohio State, to play at Clemson, where all this talent around him makes the job pretty easy. All you have to do is distribute, make good decisions, and you're probably going to be a 12-1 and team and make it to the playoffs. That's not the case for Kenny Pickett. There is talent around him, but he's had to lift it up. And he plays in a ton of high-pressure situations where he doesn't have the luxury of having a top-five defense on the other side of the ball. He has to come up with plays, and that's what you're going to be more faced with in the NFL are those types of high-pressure situations where your team needs you to step up. 
you can't you're not going to have all that talent around you so I love the potential here for Kenny Pickett too I do wonder if him being 24 hurts him somewhat in the draft process man you know most of the quarterbacks we get now are 21 and you're losing three years so you're getting a quarterback a little bit older I'm curious to see what the NFL does with a player like this didn't hurt Joe Burrow remember he came out earlier you know a little older too on that side of things so I don't think that really plays a factor I think you just want to get a guy you feel like can come in and get you wins you're not worried about how quickly he gets to 40 I think you're worried about how fast you can get him in there and start and, and see basically what we're seeing out of Mac Jones right now as a rookie Ryan, I want to talk to you about Drake London. You uh, have the Patriots taking him at 22, USC wide receiver. He fractured his ankle a couple weeks ago. He is out for the rest of the season. Uh, but talk to us about what you saw from him prior to that, how much you're worried about the ankle moving forward, and why you think he's a good fit for the Patriots. I'm not worried about the ankle as we sit here, Amanda. We'll see how NFL teams feel about him once they uh, get him to the combine. But coming into the, the season over the summer, I, I wasn't blown away with the way he played. But he has taken it to a, a, a next, the next level in, in the eight games he played for USC on an admittedly terrible USC team. Eight games, six games, for over 130 receiving yards. And you look through the advanced numbers, and this is courtesy of our guys at PFF, uh, he's a yak monster. He had 15 deep ball catches, which uh, was top five among uh, – uh, NFL, excuse me, college receivers. He had 27 screen passes, so he does it both short and long down the field. Uh, 19 contested catches, which could, you could argue, well, he doesn't get open. Well, even in tight windows, he's bring, coming down with the ball, which is something you've got to do consistently at the next level. And two months ago, I said this guy's not even close to Michael Pittman, who played at USC. He's better than Michael Pittman for me as we sit here right now. Pittman might be faster uh, in a 40-yard foot race, but the things that Drake London did on this team are things that translate and when you have a guy like Mac Jones, who's playing pretty well but not asked to do a lot, having more jump ball options down the field, and we saw Kendrick Bourne made a great catch last uh, yesterday in that touchdown in the, uh, between two defenders. Those kind of things get you excited for the Patriots who need more help uh, at the wide receiver position in terms of uh, playmakers play in and play out. Let's turn to the Cowboys at number 28 because you also have them taking a wide receiver here, Traylon Burks out of Arkansas. But, Danny, I want to start with you on this one because you say he may be the best value at wide receiver. Yeah, I mean, for what you're going to get if you do get him here at this spot. And I think, I don't know if Ryan was, you know, was playing in the Jerry Jones affinity for Arkansas into this, but it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Jerry Jones makes picks for different reasons here, and he loves those Razorbacks. I would not be surprised at all if this was the pick. And I see a big physical receiver who's had game-changing plays against the better opponents. Went over 100 yards against Auburn, 136 versus Ole Miss. He had a monster game against Texas A&M with 167 yards. He's got speed for days. He's tall, and he's physical. Like, he can body up against players and make those 50-50 jump balls. He can come down with those the majority of the time. So I love the value here at this spot. There's, it's a crowded wide receiver class. And there's going to be some guys that hit, some guys that miss. And again, I think K.J. Jefferson is a good but not an elite quarterback. So I think that's limited him somewhat. Hasn't had much talent around him as across the wide receiver position. So he's had tougher matchups playing in that SEC West. I think he's going to be a star in the making there. And if it goes to Dallas, man, right, you know, close to that Arkansas, Oklahoma, Texas, you know, kind of area, it'd be huge. Yeah, I'm with you, Danny. And his ability to separate at 225 is what gets your attention. On some levels, he feels like A.J. Brown in terms of the size and the speed, that type of player at that weight and that height and just running by people. That's the feeling you get when you watch him play. And, and I think that makes sense in Dallas, uh, again, for Dak Prescott to throw jump balls. Uh, C.D. Lamb's there. Mark Cooper's obviously there. But Michael Gallup's in the final year of his deal. They may franchise him. They may resign him. We don't know. Cedric Wilson's also in the final year of his deal. So there's not a lot of depth behind the two biggest names. And you could argue that they have other needs. Uh, even on defense, even though that defense is playing much better. But I think if Traylon Burks is sitting there, and as you know, he went to Arkansas, so Darren McFadden can make the announcement at the draft, it seems to reason that he might be an option uh, for a Cowboys offense that loves throwing the ball down the field, that loves putting up points, and that makes Jerry Jones uh, even happier if he happens to be a Razorback. It's all about making Jerry happy at this point. Uh, <laughs> Ryan has the Cardinals taking Georgia defensive lineman Jordan Davis at 30. Last week he was 19, so a bit of a drop there. But Brady, you said, look, this is so low for him. It's too he low. needs to be, what, top 10? Top 10. I mean, he's a top 10 talent. And I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a team that's not even necessarily a need for them. But when you see a guy who's six foot six, 350 pounds, who move like, moves like a dancing bear and makes really is the anchor of this Georgia defense.
I mean, you're not going to find a team that's going to pass up on him. You know, you can't teach this. You can't coach that sort of size and athleticism. <laughs> and so even though you don't have quite as much productivity as far as the stats, when you watch the tape, he jumps off every single game, every single time. So, again, it won't be a need for a team. It's just the fact that they're going to look at him and say, he is too good to pass up on. Ryan Wilson, Danny Cannell, Brady Quinn, thank you guys so much. We'll do it again next Monday and go through Ryan's latest mock draft. It's at number 13, I think, Ryan. Just shake your head yes or no because we're short on time there. Eh, ish, ish. You can hear much more from Ryan and the rest of the guys with Big Six Podcast. Your daily NFL picks, latest podcast there, giving you a Monday Night Football betting preview. Also, Week 10 recap so far. What is wrong with Russ or did he just come back too early? Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.